Hi, welcome to the first full episode of the Wisconsin Spirit of the Wild hunting team. As you know, my name is Dick Fenhouse. I've been hunting for the better part of 20 years now, this season alone, all thanks to my dad, William Fenhouse, who has been hunting for the better part of 44 years this year alone. So, Dad, go ahead and tell us, how did you get started? How did this all come about for you? Uh, I got started when um, I was 10 years old and my mom, uh, I didn't have a dad when I was growing up, so she enrolled me in the Big Brothers program and through my big brother, Jim Hefter, that's how I learned on tagging along when I was 10 years old, squirrel hunting, duck hunting, pheasant hunting, basically being the bird dog, chasing down, you know, running through cornfields and chasing up the geese and stuff like that. Well, that, that's how I got into it, and when I turned 12, I got my first hunting license and shot my first uh, duck, which was a green wing teal, and then uh, from that point on, the rest is history. That's I, I've been, I, I, the first probably um, five, six years hunting, I just spent shooting ducks and geese. You know, deer hunting really wasn't a, a, a passion of mine. That comes later on. I just was more into the duck and goose hunting, small game stuff like that. That's how we all start out. That's how we all start out. That's you got to start somewhere. So then, when did when did you become a deer hunter? I became a deer hunter um, back in ninth. I've got, I've been going deer hunting since I was twelve years old, but I really didn't enjoy it. Even when I um, went up with my dad. In 1980 and that's when with him he thinks I shot my first year it's not I shot one earlier than that but to him that's when I shot my first year and you know I, I really didn't like the cold I really didn't like being out in the snow as a matter of fact the day that I was sh I shot my first year he was home with my brother because he was sick and I was sitting on a log I was making snowballs throwing them at the birds and throwing them at the squirrels you know I wasn't even paying attention because I was you know, up by Humbert, off a of county, off a of county trunk B, and uh, down in the Cranberry Marsh, and I thought, you know, there's gonna be no deer running around in here. So I was just depressed that I wasn't seeing anything else. And I look off to my left, here comes this doe walking, and I got my little 30-30 Winchester lever action rifle and fired two shots and got my first deer. <laughs> now, for those of those, um, for those actually watching and following us and following along with us, and that have been. Has all of this land that you've been hunting on public or private? Most of it has been public hunting grounds. I have had the opportunity to hunt private and shoot some fairly decent deer. Uh, however, some of the biggest deer that I've shot have been on public hunting grounds. So then would you say that when it comes to the controversial debate between public land and private land, public land would be better? They, they have their advantages and they have their disadvantages. The advantages to hunting private land is you don't have the pressure. The deer can walk around at will all day long, all hours of the day. On public <laughs> land, you have to be willing to take what comes along when it comes along. Because if you don't, I guarantee you the next hunter that's 100 yards down away from you, they're going to shoot that animal. And, you know, to me, antler size doesn't matter. Yes, I'd like to shoot a big buck like as everybody else would. Absolutely. But when it comes to having meat on the table, I'm going to take that doe and I don't care. That deer is a trophy and it's my animal and I have the right to pursue that and take that animal. And I'm going to do that if the right opportunity arises. So since antler size doesn't matter, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Fred Bear. Yep. He, one of the things that he always talked about was that antler size doesn't matter. If you go for the size of the antler you might as well just be a yardstick. Do you think that he was actually onto something when he was still around? I do, and, and, I, and I think um, not only Fred Bear, but some of the other greats, Ben Lee, who's now passed away, uh, Jackie Bushman, Bill Jordan, Ted Nugent, just to name a few. You know, th these guys are after the big rack bucks, and that's all fine and dandy if you have the property to do it, which a lot of these hunting shows, like Bill Jordan's Real Tree, these are on game farms and game ranches. They raise these deer to be that big. You know, you're you're not going to find on public hunting grounds a big 300-pound whitetail. It's just not going to happen. Unless it's all muscle and you've got steep, great hills. 
it, it's, I, I shouldn't say that it's not possible. I mean, it's very seldomly ever going to happen that you're going to find a big 30 inch wide, 32 inch wide, 300 pound whitetail on public hunting grounds. Fair point. So explain to us what, what do you do in for off season prep? Well, how do you get ready for the opening for opening day in the months to follow? My, my, my view and my preparation is that deer season never stops. It's, it's a day to day yearly thing. You, you can stop and, and not sit there and say, well, I'll pick up my bow maybe two weeks before and shoot a few arrows and, and think that, well, I'm still on, I'm still good. No, it doesn't work that way. You might get lucky, but that's not prep. That's not doing your scouting. That's not doing your practicing, doing your homework. I mean, you owe it to this animal to, you know, humanely kill it as fast as you can. You don't want to shoot one and have it run 300 yards into private property because if you don't have permission to go after it, now it's lost. And, exactly. you know, that's that's not deer hunting. That's just being selfish and it's kind of piggish too. So then to a point, um, much like with all the other hunters out there, uh, obviously obtaining permission from the owner is a, a key must if it does go that far. If, if you're hunting along a public, private, um, it is always best months before, months before, to obtain landowner's permission. Get it in writing if you can, even more so better, because if you decide that if you have permission and you run into somebody else on the land, they don't know it, you know, they're going to call the sheriff's department and you're going to get fined whether you had permission or not. But if you have it in writing, you know, and then, you know, sincerely tell an off to the landowner, you know, say, hey, I'll give you a backstrap, I'll give you a hindquarter. You know, share the wealth with them because he's, he's got all his farm chores that he's got to do or, you know, whatever he's got to do to his land. So he probably doesn't get out that much. And, you know, it's, it, it really, they're really appreciative of when you can give, give a little bit back to them. So then let's talk about camouflage prep. Um, as for me, as some of you have probably seen in most of my other past content, is I hang my clothes up on a line. I'll soak them with a garden hose. And I'll let it all air dry. Does how does that work? How do you prepare your camouflage? I I, I have mine sealed away. Um, everything from my regular street clothes and my camouflage is separate. Socks, underwear, t-shirts, the camouflage that I wear when I'm hunting, that's all stored separate. It is. It's not even laundered in the same washer and dryer. It's you know everything is done separately and stored away. <coughs> It's stored away in uh, an airtight bag, compressed all the way down, air is taken out of it so that it doesn't get moisture, it doesn't get moth in there, it doesn't get mold in there. And, and it has like scent wafers in there so that it, it maintains an earth scent smell. And, and you know, we'll, we'll touch on, on how I feel about scents in a little bit, but it, you know, this is what I do and it's, it's constantly driving around looking at fields, looking at deer, watching them grow through the summer, through the spring and summer, into the fall, watching their attitudes, how many are out there. You know, th there's just so much that people just don't pay attention to. And it makes a difference between whether you're a successful deer hunter or one just sitting there cutting your tags up at the end of the season going, don't gun it, why didn't I see a deer? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, I see you have a bow here. What can you tell us about this bow? Now, this is my Dart and Maverick compound. I bought this bow brand new in 1997, so this is going on 25 years old now. 10 years younger than me. <laughs> well, a little bit younger than that, I'm only 32. <laughs> so, um, the bow that I had before this was a Dart and Mark IV, and the bow that I had before that was a recurve. And that's what I shot my very first year was a recurve bow. I shot it out in the Eldorado Marsh near Fond du Lac. And I upgraded to this for, at that time, because I wanted the power, it's a faster bow, it's a single cam uh, technology, um, it shoots 277 feet per second, um, it's got a 30 inch draw length, uh, sight master sight, um, if you, you're going to notice that, you're going to see some pink on there, and that pink is on there to... Uh, represent and memorialize the women who fight breast cancer. Awesome. Awesome. 
Now I noticed that it's a, a fluorescent color. Um, I mean, obviously, pink being the uh, color color ribbon for the Women's Breast Cancer Awareness. Um, safety purposes as well, maybe. I I, I guess you could say that because it it really does stand out against the green of the woods and. You know, I have my... Uh, yeah, I was going to ask about this. What, what, what is this little piece of cotton you have hanging down here? What it, is it, that it's, for? A, it's actually a wind indicator. So when I have it sitting in, you know, when it's hanging up on a tree, and I'm, I'm not in favor of of uh, having your wheels or your cams hanging on there. So I, I made this up, and I, you know, it had the hole already drilled in the bolt. So I hang this on a hook off of, or off of a branch. And I use this as a wind indicator to tell me which way the wind is constantly blowing. Now that is that is genius. I will admit, I like that, and I like this whole little hook thing. I've seen a lot of that. So what 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 else do you use? I see this release. I don't see a whole lot of these releases around anymore. What? No. Th yeah, this is a very old one. Um, I'm not even sure where I got it from anymore. But you know, it's it still works. It's still so then let's let's get right to it's opening morning. What's the, what do you do for opening morning? <coughs> Pardon me. When I get out to, to the spot that I'm gonna hunt, I just kind of like sit back in the car a little bit, take a couple of deep breaths, and you know just kind of look at the sky above, look and see if it's a starry sky or partly cloudy sky. You know, kind of get the wind direction feel and. You know, and as I as I get out of the car, and you know, I just kind of like, you know, look up and a ask for a safe hunt, and if we're with multiple people, that you know that we all be patient with each other, and uh, that we all say a prayer, and you know that that we're successful deer hunters. I mean, that's what that's what we're out there to do is is to hunt a deer and hopefully try to take one and be successful at what we do. I mean, we are the stewards of the sport. We are the caretakers of the land, and, you know, there are people that are watching us that are anti-hunters, or they're not quite sure if they want to get into it, and how you portray yourself out there is going to make a big difference. I, I totally agree. How, how we behave out in the woods is, you know, very crucial and plays an important role, because as you said, we, there's people always out there watching, critiquing what others do. Uh... For me, growing up watching you, I was always watching you, seeing how happy and at peace you were growing up, and I, I wanted to share that experience with you, and when I was able to come out with you at the age of seven, and then officially start hunting with you in 2002 when I graduated Hunter Safety, um, you know, those were memorable moments because much like with you, you know, it was big brother little brother or in some cases father son and you know there's always somebody watching and either wanting to or looking for a reason to um condemn the sport and it happens there's nothing really that can be done about it but some would ask how do you how do you handle somebody who wants to get up in your face that's anti-hunter no, you just have to um, stand your ground. You have to be firm with it and, you know, try to point out to them that, you know, the land can only hold so many animals before starvation sets in or before uh, animals start being hit on the road. And, you know, you just brought up a picture um, of, two di of two deer that have been hit and they were fairly close to each other. Now, I can't be certain for sure if they were hit individually or if it was a deliberate act that somebody hit both of them. But, you know, to me, if, if there's that many deer around, go ahead and take them. <clears throat> I mean, you know, to, to see two deer like that, um, and from what do they look like in the pictures that they were both those, you know, they may have been both carrying fawns. So that's anywhere from four to six deer lost. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see that, especially just to see them laying on the side of the road within probably 10, 15 feet of each other. Well, I will be happy to actually say that I'm not happy about, you know, that I had to see, you know, two deer at the end of some kid driveway while getting dropped off after school. I mean, I, I wouldn't know what to say about it. Um, 
but since I do drive past that area periodically to and from on my way to work, I can actually say that shortly after I made the post on Facebook about it, uh, the next day they were, uh, probably two days after the post had been seen, uh, the deer were actually removed and are no longer at that location. So for those that took the matter and removed the deer's body off the private property where there were obviously children present since they were taking a school bus, I want to personally thank you guys for taking that opportunity to clean that up, whether you were the property owner itself or some nice Samaritan or even the local authorities. Because as hunters, I don't like driving down the highways. I understand deer cross in areas, but like I said in the post, we have car horns, we have uh, uh, hazard lights, you know, we have brakes. I do believe um, probably a couple people out there watching would probably even agree that when they are, when we are being taught to drive, to slow down, put the hazards on if we're still on the road, if, especially if it's a busy road, and delay to be aware on what's the side of the road, and if it's an animal, try and do what we can to scare that animal away. Now, deer are intelligent creatures. I do believe you would agree with that statement. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, they've, they've been doing what they've been doing for for hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years through evolution to what they are now. You know, they know how to get around. They know what to eat. They know when to eat. You know, they, they have their schedule that they keep to. And it may sound funny to a lot of people, but, you know, deer are very intelligent animals. You know, they can outsmart you. They are the hide-and-seek world champions. There's no doubt about it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, hunting for 20 years, I mean, I've learned not to hunt and go hunt in locations where I think the deer are going to be at, but more so where I know the deer are going to be, to pattern, to pattern their movements. Um, and this is everything that you have taught me over the years, so if I'm ever wrong... And, and it's part of your prep. It's that, that scouting to get to... And it's not so much where you think they are, it's where they're not. Because when you get off of the beaten trail that they use, they have a secondary trail and they have a third dairy trail. You know, they have their means of escape. And that's what you're looking for when you're out doing your scouting, is those trails that they could potentially use to get away in emergency situations. It's nice to set up near bedding grounds, near uh, uh, where, where they feed. But, and water sources, but look for the trails that you don't think that, you know, well, maybe they haven't used this one in years, but that's the trails that you're going to want to watch because those are the ones they're going to use when they need to use them. And when they need to get out of, a, of an area in a hurry, that's where they're going to go, and that's where you need to set up, and that's where you're going to be successful. Now, a lot of people, they'll see, let's talk diversity. When it comes to habitat, a lot of hunters go for them hardwood areas, um, some people for the ridge tops or the ridge bottoms. Um, tell us a little bit about diversity. If we're out scouting this land, uh, what kind of habitat should we be looking for? I mean, will any open field do? Is there something that, is there some kind of chemistry that they look for? Yeah, um, for, the, for the most part, um, deer do not like to be out into open fields because they know they're exposed, especially during the hunting season. They, they will travel fence lines, ridge lines. Um, they'll, they'll, they know their winds and which way they have to go. Um, but from my personal view and from the deer that I've shot over the years, I've shot them between woods and pines. And, you know, maybe having that creek bottom or that stream running through there where they stop to get their water, uh, maybe a little ditch in the woods where um, it's going to have a little bit of water in it. Um, cornfields are always uh, hunting the edges of cornfields. Um, if, 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 if you have the ability to place a stand or a uh, ladder stand or a tower blind or whatever. Um, yeah. I, I believe all areas are capable of, of being successful in, in harvesting deer. Um, you just don't want to limit to yourself constantly because when you do that, they pattern you and they have start to avoid that area. If you're going to hunt a particular ridge line every day, you're going to walk in the same direction every day. You know what? They're going to pattern you. They're going to figure you out and you ain't going to see nothing. You might get lucky. I'm not saying you won't, 
But when it comes to bull season, when you're trying to get that animal within 10, 20 yards, <laughs> good luck because they've already patted you and, you know, it's bull hunting is a lot different than gun. I mean, you can shoot a deer three, 400 yards away. That's, that's nothing. But when you got to do it 10, 20 yards away, that's a whole I, different ball game. I was actually just about to ask you that. There, there's an old controversial debate out there, obviously as old as probably time itself since probably when bows started coming around and uh, gun versus bow. But me personally, as every, everybody is probably out, knows out there, is I'm a very avid bow hunter. I love bow hunting. I've got nothing against gun hunting because, yeah, you can reach out and touch them. There's no question on that. But for me, for some reason, I feel more at peace and more connected with, you know, the great holy creator that they are and the mother earth through bow hunting because I do believe that it may be a small amount, but that we do share some Lakota Sioux Indian bloodline with the Native Americans. Maybe a small amount, but yeah. I do believe that it that we do share it. Well, first and foremost, I'm a deer hunter, and my, my passion lies with bow hunting. I would rather bow hunt than gun hunt, but since I have the opportunity and the capability to do both, you know, so be it. I, I, have, I have no problem picking up either weapon or even a crossbow and, and going out and trying to do my best to harvest uh, and, and help the DNR manage their quotas for the year so that, you know, you know, we're not we're not, we're not seeing these dead deer laying in the woods from starvation. We're not seeing them laying on the highways. You know, I rather have the meat on in my freezer than laying on a highway somewhere. So then, that since you brought up crossbows, that brings up um, another debate. There's a lot of hunters out there that believe that crossbows should only be limited to those with physical um, disadvantages towards you know somebody like me who can stand up and you know, walk that half mile hike out there to get to my stand. What What is your input on crossbows versus compounds? You know, I'm, I'm getting up there in age. My, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 57 during the hunting season this year. And, you know, as much as I would like to stay with the compound, there's just going to be come a time where I'm just not going to be able to pull this back anymore. And... It's, it's going to be easier on my back. It's going to be easier on my shoulders and my arms as I grow older to be able to use the, the crossbow. Um, I, I don't believe that you should be restricted or that, you know, um, I, I, don't, I don't think that restricting anybody to one type of weapon is the right thing to do. I, that's why I think so many people got turned off and why the why our DNR now is, is trying to promote all these hunting activities to get people back into it because they, they literally killed it off by saying that, well, you can only have this during this season, you can only have this during this season, and you have a muzzleloader season or a four-day antlerless. You know, I, I don't think that's right. I think you, you're, you're a deer hunter first and foremost, and you should be able to use whatever is within your realm of capability and to make you a successful deer hunter. I, I agree. I I wholeheartedly agree that it should be open to everybody. I mean, like you said, as you're getting older, you know, um, a single recurve crossbow would probably be more suffice versus um, a single cam uh, cro crossbow through either Barnett or Centerpoint or even the new models from Dartnet. I don't know if you've seen the new models through Dart and Archery. I have not yet. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I, I prefer both. Um, over the years, I've been experiencing issues with my shoulder, and I have found that the crossbows have been more comfortable. Um, last year, for some of the followers out there on Instagram, and as well as Facebook, you've seen that the Centerpoint Sniper Elite 385 that I have purchased um, successfully gotten two deer within its first year after purchase. How many deer would you say roughly that this Darton has successfully brought home to you? <laughs> Let's see, I'm from, from about 97 to about, oh, today. To, to about today, um, I, I'm guessing probably maybe right around 
ballpark figure, 25, 30 deer have gone down to this garden? 25, 30 deer. That's, that's impressive. That's, I'll, I'll admit. Now, I actually did one year have a privilege to use this Darton, and it, it was a great honor to have shot my first buck with. I was gonna say, you know, how would that turn <laughs> out for you? <laughs> that that was a very memorable. That was a very memorable moment. Now let's talk about memorable hunts. Let's dive right into the the juicy stories, because everybody out there right now is probably wondering what kind of stories a forty four year hunting veteran has got. So let's break it down. Give us some of your best hunting memories that you can come up with. Well, they're right here in this book, and they're also in the in my mind, and they're and it lives within the spirit of the whitetail itself. So, you know, you probably can't see this very well, but this is me when I was 15 years old and I shot my first deer with my dad. Mind if I take that out and show the camera? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. That was a youngin back then. <laughs> <laughs> and I see there's one hidden behind. Oh, look at that. And it's a Polaroid. Oh, boy. Yeah, they, they didn't have the technology back in 1980 that we have now, so. You got to be real gentle and gender with it. And there's another picture. Oh, oh. This is part of your 1980 Hunter's Choice Permit before yep. attempting to use read instructions on front and back thoroughly. Wow. Yeah, you had a Hunter's Choice back then that allowed you to shoot a buck or a doe. You didn't have the multiple tags that you get now. And then there it is, 1980, 1.33 p.m. Where were you? I was up by a little town called Humberg, Wisconsin, off the county trunk B, uh, across from Wildcat National Park, down in the Cranberry Marsh, and it was, uh, it was like 30 degrees that day. Uh, it was snow on the ground, and um, my dad couldn't be with me the day that I shot that. I was with my stepmom and her son, Jerry, and... I'm just sitting on a log throwing snowballs because I'm so bored and, you know, I'm cold and I'm trying to keep warm and I see squirrels climbing up the trees I'm whipping snowballs at them, and, you know, and this is like, you know, this is really boring. I, I'm, you know, at that time I really didn't care about gun hunting and stuff like that. It's just way too cold in November, way too much snow and, you know, it's so bulky and eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and stuff like that, yuck. You know? So and all of a sudden I just happened to look off to my left and here comes this go walking past me and fired two shots with a 30-30 lever action Winchester rifle and down and I got my first deer. That is awesome. That is awesome. And I do believe that that 30-30 Winchester is still in operation to this day. Absolutely. And how does she fire? At, just like she did when she was brand new. Um, I've traced the serial numbers on it and that gun was made brand new in 1954. That is that is awesome, and that was your grandfather's? Right, my grandfather's and my grandmother's gun. So it's a family heirloom. Yes, it is. Awesome. So, you know, when you're, when you're talking memories, you know, here they are. And Some see, th this just goes to show that you don't have to... Now, how, I'm, out of curiosity, how many pages is this? Okay, so that goes all the way up to a Ted Nugent concert, it looks like, in... Uh, deer park in Probably 10, 10, 12 pages. 10, 12 pages. And how many of these deer would you say you shot? Every one of them but two. So hard work, patience, dedication. Uh, how often do you practice? Um, depending on the work schedule, I, I, I would like to try to get out more. And for the, for the younger uh, generation that's coming up, you, you need to get out as much as you can. If you can get out every Saturday or get out for a couple hours on Sunday, Go to a range and practice with that bull, or even in the backyard if you're it's okay with your neighbors and stuff like that. So you're not shooting up their garages or, you know, shooting up someone's vehicle and stuff like that. You don't want to have an arrow bounce off of something and lodge in someone's engine compartment or windshield of their car. <laughs> um, you know, you, you got to get out and do your practicing. You got to practice, practice, practice. And when you're sick of it, you got to keep practicing. It's the only way you're going to get good. You know, these teams that win championships year after year. They don't just sit, I mean, you know, I, I'm not a Packer fan, but we'll just look at the Packers. You know, they, they didn't get to two NFC championships just by sitting on their ass all year long. You know, they worked for it. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for them, but, you know, they practiced and 
you know, they, they had mistakes. So they'll get better just like every team does, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, you know. And that follows pretty much with, pretty much with hunting. You know, you got to you got to do your scouting, you got to do your practicing, you got to get to know your weapons, and you know you got to know where you're shooting, how you're shooting, whether it's up or down, left and right, and you know when when you put it all together, this is what's going to happen. This is what you're going to come up with, and you're going to start shooting really some impressive deer. I, I'll admit there's there's definitely somebody, and I've looked through this binder almost year after year with you um not only are these your memories but some of these coming up here are in the 90s early 90s i can see mom's old white pontiac sitting right there the chevy yep. blazer that we were in the accident with now let's talk about one more controversial debate that a lot of people seem to have a problem with or at least one i find entertaining kind of have a little bit of a chuckle at hunting what is hunting to you it's it's being with friends and family it's it's not the kill it's the thrill of the chase there is nothing more rewarding than being around your family your friends watching the young kids come up and see how they how they react because you know you're you're the you're the role model you're the parent they're gonna follow what you do if you are successful and you do it right they're going to do it right. They're going to do it right by you. If you're careless, you know, it's anybody's game. You know, they're, they're going to lose interest in it. And, you know, when, when you when they become careless, that's when accidents happen. And nobody, you know, certainly you don't want to have to be the one making a phone call to someone's parents saying that, you know, no. somebody got injured or shot because they were messing around with their guns or their bowl and they weren't paying attention to what they're doing. It all comes down to practice and patience. Now, people can... Now, obviously nobody is... We don't force anybody to go out hunting. Obviously, it's a person's choice whether they want to be a hunter or not. For some, um, you know, for me, obviously, watching you, like I've mentioned earlier, it was a pleasure and a joy watching you come home with deer almost every day of every season. Uh... Even sometimes coming home with more than one deer in the morning, um, four deer in the morning on a holiday hunt, uh, sitting out in the cold. Obviously, deer hunting is not for a lot of people. Um, for me, I, I look at it as it's a yes or no basic. It's either if you want to do it, go ahead, find yourself a mentor, or do your research on it. Obviously, study your animals. That's where your scouting comes yep. in. Um, with the technology that we have today, we have the internet right at our fingertips when at one point in time it was classified intel because it was only the military's use. But now we can even Google and research whitetail um, or any animal for that matter. We can figure out how they see, how they think, or what they move like without the, all the anatomy and the gross stuff and all that. Um, but for me, it's a yes or no. It's either you want to do it or you don't want to do it. To me, there should be no in the middle kind of like, well, I want to do it, so I'm going to just kind of do it periodically and just kind of hold off, like you said, practice. Um, obviously, practice does make perfect. Sometimes practice is always the best route to go because if you don't try, you won't succeed. Right. Do you believe that my belief and my, uh, my thought process on it being a yes or no is fair? Sure, because, you know... You, you, you can't force somebody to go out. They're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to enjoy it. And, you know, chances are you've seen a deer or uh, becoming a successful hunter that day or, you know, it's it's not going to happen. It's going to be miserable for everybody. It's going to turn that young person off. And, you know, that that's not the reason why you're out there. You're out there to have a good time. You're out there to, to teach and... Um, show the young person that's with you that you're mentoring you know this is a deer track this is deer poop you know these are the leaves that they eat this is where they drink you know here's their trail that they're you know running on and stuff like that you know and maybe you get the chance to see a couple running through the woods and stuff like that you know and, and you just gotta hope that you're, you're doing it right so that they want to pick up on it and follow in your footsteps like you did with, you know, like I did with you and, you know, 
you pick it up and you you you've done your homework and you've been successful you've shot your share of deer and um you know and now basically it's what you have been teaching me or what you have taught me because hunting is a learning experience there's no expert there's never i don't care who you are in life and somebody can yell at me all they want but i'm going to come out and say there's no expert there's no professional in any form in any context i don't care if you're a college teacher i don't care if you're the head surgeon of the united states the secretary of defense there is no expert you can be the number one rated scientist in in world renown i don't care you're not an expert you're not a professional only because there's always something new to learn the, every, the element of change every day brings on new opportunities every day brings on new horizons the sun teaches that every day the sun teaches us um every day to rise shine even on gloomy days like today we've got rainy days i'm looking out the window right now and i see clear skies on the western horizon as the sun sets it was a great day and much like um my grandfather and your father once taught us before his passing as long as you wake up with air in your lungs and a good solid heartbeat today was a good day yes it is and for, for the people that are that are going to be watching this and viewing this um i'm going to give a shout out to the person behind the camera right now <laughs> actually <laughs> both of them yeah I, I'll, I'll agree with him on this because because our, our friend d got her first buck last year it was a five point buck and her, her first deer, and it goes to show that even the most beginning of hunters have the most successful first year. And it was a great year. We had a very rough start to the year, and I'm not even going to lie. So it was rough. <laughs> it, it was very rough. Um, we we had issues, uh, both with her crossbow, D, um, D stringing itself off the cams. Um, we she took it to a shop uh, here in Wisconsin. I'm not going to mention names out of respect for the company, and again, we are respectful hunters, so I don't want to destroy their reputation that they have in good standings with their business partners and their loyal customers. But uh, we finally found a good shop that was able to redo her cams for her. Um, but that was after she had shot her first buck, which was a first deer. And for those of you wondering, yes, I actually still do have that clip. We weren't able to secure good video footage of it because it was still in the early hours after 6 a.m. The woods were still dark. But you can hear the words clear as day. You can hear the excitement. You can hear the thrills. Um, unfortunately, after the recovery of the deer, the camera kind of up and just <laughs> and we weren't able to get the official well, when, when, congratulations you, know, you mentioned when we had a rough start you know um a, a lot of people probably don't know that you know we witnessed a horrific accident yeah that there was a fatality right down the road from where we were hunting yep what did um that morning uh it, it was it was very rough there was a head-on collision involving uh, an older gentleman and a younger gentleman um it took us we, we normally get out to the hunting land about anywhere between 4 4 30 ish um we weren't able to actually get out into the field on time but when we were able to um i was actually very surprised and very excited at the fact that she was even able to pull off such a stunning shot and for those of you questioning on how far this shot was, I'm not even going to lie, 15 feet, 5 yards, target panic as all can be, <laughs> but it happens to the best of us, I'm sure even in your 44 years oh, yeah, it happens. Oh yeah, absolutely, you know, I'm sitting up in the tree stand and I look back and I see that deer sneaking up behind me, my heart starts just to racing like it did when I was a youngster myself, you know. When, when you got to get that animal in that close, the slightest move, the slightest, you know, you do anything, and that animal is going to pick you up in a heartbeat, and it's not even funny. They will be out and gone before you even can spell yourself. They're, they're, they're miles away. They're, they're, they're in the next county already. They're, they're booking it. And that's their flight or fight response, and, you know, most chances they're just going to take off and get the heck out of Dodge. Now let's let's talk more about some hunting memories. I've got a couple I remember. 
These were with you, and I'm pretty sure these will bring a smile to your face and a good laugh to our viewers. Um, I've had a deer lick my boot. Yep. I, 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 I could have kicked this this buck right in the snow, yep. I do believe, because you woke me. I was a little boy. Yes, believe it or not. So you were about 13 or 14 years old, and you were sleeping on a log. We were out doing some crop tag hunting, and you had found this nice log to stretch out and fell asleep, and... You know, just before sunset, here comes this buck walking out of the pine walks right up to him and starts licking the snow off his boots. <laughs> <laughs> Not even kidding. So then we we got another one. Um, for a lot of us hunters out there, when you gotta go, you gotta go. You gotta and go. Some, sometimes you can you can manage to hold it. Sometimes you can't. Um, I got out of an elevated ground blind because there was a wasp nest and I couldn't tolerate it. And I found myself in a nice niche where I could look both east and west on my left and right. And I could see along the edge of the woods. Well, and like I said, when nature calls, nature calls. And it's not the first time this has happened to me. It's not the, and it will not be the last time it happens. And I, I just saw a hand of vouch here. I'm pretty sure uh, my girlfriend and my best friend can testify to this too as rookies. When you gotta go, you gotta go, but when you leave your equipment and out of reach while going to the bathroom yeah. is usually when it happens. Now, I had to go and all my rifle was on the ground and I had this buck walk right in front of me and stop and just kind of give me one of those head twist moves and watch me. For the longest time. I do believe you were on the hilltop right above me, just behind me, watching the whole thing while you were laughing. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so what other great hunting memories do we have? Other than what's, what's in here. What memories are not in here? Um, the year that you shot a big doe. I mean, we were just uh, out in the White River Marsh north of Princeton, and um, we'd gotten down and set you up in a lock-on stand and I went and sat up and your, your mom was sitting in another stand and um, I went and sat out on the edge of the woods and all of a sudden I hear this shot go off and I you know yelled was that was that you uh, to, to your mom and she said no and I said that must have been Kip then so we get down and your Kip's got this humongous freaking doe laid on the ground I mean I'm not even kidding this thing was huge I bet you that was all of 180 pounds, 190 pounds. This thing was big. I've never seen a doe that big until the year 2000, maybe 15 or 16, when I shot a 210-pound doe. I do believe um, it was either 2016 or 2017. It had to have been 2017 when we took that uh, adventure up to Trepolo County because we were invited up for Thanksgiving. That, that would have been 2005. Are you sure? Because yep. I believe we lived on Fenton Street at the time. Yep. Because that's Cause when that's I, I divorced your mom. Okay. So it was 2015, 2016. 2005. Oh, 2005. 2005, 2006. Oh. Probably 2006. <laughs> yeah. But we were invited up to Trepolo County. And for some of you that haven't been to Wisconsin, uh, we have some pretty gnarly graded hills here in Wisconsin, out near the Mississippi, to a point. Yeah, to, to the west of us. Uh, and, and we're, we're in the eastern farmland or, and stuff like that. And the, we're, we're talking grades here. They're, they're up. They're, they're pretty big hills to climb. And and get down those whitetail got pretty big. Uh, the hunting party that had invited us out, they managed to secure uh, what appeared to be three decent sized deer at the time, the, the biggest being what, a six pointer? It was an eight pointer. It was the biggest deer that they had shot off this property in, in 25, 30 years. And it had probably a good, you know, 18, 19, maybe 20 inch spread on it. And, you know, we, we were impressed that, you know, this guy got it with an, an AR-15 and, you know, and we decided to go sit on the same farm property that they shot this deer on and, um, you take it from there. You, it was your gear. So, <laughs> I'm sitting, uh, we got nestled into the bottom of this, uh, I got nestled into this bottom of the ravine, um, just, um, just outside of the farm field there. Um, and as research has shown that they're going to use the cover of the ravines to move along and the edges of the ravines, well, I wasn't expecting what to happen at that point. 
I heard rustling and I was looking around trying to find this deer. I, or maybe it was a squirrel. A lot of us deer hunters know it can't always be a deer. Yeah. It's usually a squirrel, maybe sometimes even a raccoon, maybe another hunter. We don't know. I happened to look on the top of this hill and I saw this deer. Now, general rule of thumb is if you can make a clean kill, make the cleanest kill you possibly can. Um, for me, when I am doe, if, um, if all I have are doe tags and I'm going to secure a doe, um, generally I'm going to try and aim for the heart. Otherwise, um, if I can get a clean shot, I will go for the head if need be. It's the, it's the quickest and cleanest kill possible. Um, I know the animal's not going to run at all. It's going to drop dead before it even hits the ground, which is what I want. Um, that being said, that was actually my mistake, and it, mistakes are made, um, like you had mentioned earlier. Mistakes can be made when you are reckless, um, and when tar target panic sets in is when that recklessness usually starts to come about for most hunters. Such as, this story is a perfect example of the prime mistake of not knowing your target exactly, which is a big thing for a lot of hunters, is know your target and what is beyond yeah. Treat every firearm as if it were loaded. Um, I made the mistake of misidentifying this whitetail as a doe, and I shot for the head. Now, luckily, I was using the 7.62 by 39 millimeter bolt action at the time, I do yeah. believe. Yeah. Um, small little caliber bullet, but it's it, real great for uh, starter gun. It's really great for any beginning hunter. I do believe so myself. I honestly think that the 30 out 6 and the 270, those bigger caliber, heavier bullets, um, I personally believe are too big for a starter gun. Uh, the 7.62 by 39 was a perfect beginner gun for me. It was awesome. I loved it with everything that I had. Uh, so I made the perfect shot. I clean kill, side of the head. Um, I, when you came to help me retrieve it, um, we didn't find it at the top of the hill. No. It had rolled down the other side of the hill. And I was aiming up. So knowing what my, knowing, okay, I've got a deer in front of me. And we, and we, we knew what was on the other side. We knew what, when that bullet went through. It was nothing it but county. It, it was nothing but open woods. I mean, there was no farmhouses. You know, yeah, there was, there was no danger that that bullet was going to come down. And that's that's where knowing your knowledge during the off season comes in. Is you're looking at these topography maps, you're looking at your world atlas maps. Um, Onyx, uh, the hunt app. Um, I use Hunt Stand for all of my information. Back then, obviously, we didn't have that technology. No. We had to use actual maps and topography maps. Yeah. You had to get out and do your walking. You had to. Go out and you drive, drive the roads. Yep. Drive the roads to know where where you are and where your boundaries were, and you know you had to get those landowners permission so that if you were lucky enough to hit a deer and it took, if it took off running and went on somebody's property, you know it, it's always best to get the landowners permission. Well, when we finally recovered the deer, we had realized uh, during the recovery of the deer that we'd actually found an antler that still had part of the skull. Uh, attached to it and once we recovered the deer we made the realization that since I was so reckless and careless in my target panic at the time of wanting to get the deer um, I had actually shot in a buck luckily I had a buck tag because I hadn't used my buck tag at all because we were having such poor luck in the White River um, so I was able to use and make a clean kill on a buck without actually knowing it. How big was that buck? 12 point buck when I do believe when we dressed him out Oh, he went and we got him back to the house that he was about 210 219 I think it was and then the next day we turned around I turned around and I shot that doe we both shot the doe yep and then on the last day of our gun hunt the last morning Sunday morning the, no like I said let, let's do the setup they hunted this property for the last 25 years the most deer they ever got out of it was four they got they got an eight-pointer and three does the year that we went up there we're up there three days. We got a 12 pointer, a dole, and a five point in three and, days. And I was fresh off of a year from, from gun hunting. I, I can't remember the issue reason why, but I was just coming back from a gun, um, from a year off of hunting and it was a great way to come back to the season. It really was, um, Needless to say, they didn't want us back up there again. They haven't invited us back since. They probably lost their contact information at this point. 
And either way, it doesn't matter because we still had a great time. Now, public versus private. But I don't know, I, I can't remember if we covered this. I prefer public because it is more pure. It is the as wild as it can get. I mean, there's no human interaction unless well, it's during the hunting season. Y y yes and no. They're... Um, private owners are out there, you know, they're doing their, their thing with their land and, and, you know, doing their clear cutting and trimming of branches and stuff that overgrow from season to season and stuff like that. But public hunting is more of a challenge. When you have, you know, where, where we were deer hunting, you could have anywhere, the three of us, D, you, myself, maybe even Paul with us. But then, you know, what if a couple other people show up? You know, the property's not that big, and now you're starting to encroach on other people, and, you know, things start to become uncomfortable because you don't want to take that, that shot because you don't know where that person went. You can't see them when all the leaves are on the tree and stuff like that. They've got camouflage on. Gun season, when you have your orange on, it's a whole different story. You can see them, you know, so then it's you safe. can see a country mile away. But during bull season, you know, you have to be so much aware of your surroundings and, and who might be creeping up. I, I had a guy walk 40 yards in front of me one day. I was up in the tree, and he never even saw me sitting there. It, it, it does happen, and that's one of the many risks with bow hunting is, um, you know, you're in camouflage, and you're blended in with your surroundings. Some incidences, um, depending on what state you're in, and it doesn't really matter where you live in the United States, it happens at just about everywhere some innocent deer hunter is often mistaken for a deer because of the camouflage or is mistaken for another animal which is why I usually encourage and you encourage the team to wear either an orange hat or something to kind of stand out like a fluorescent pink or blaze orange but something to stand out to say hey look I am not what you think I am yeah, I'm, I'm here you know I'm up in this tree and you know I, I've had squirrel hunters um, come out with their kids and you know they got their little 22s and the little kid's looking right up and he's looking in the tree and I'm you know I'm just sitting over the stand and I'm just looking down looking right at him and it's like oh my god dad there's somebody, somebody up in the tree you know it, it does happen it, it, and you know if if you're not paying attention if you're not aware of those surroundings this is where you know you could be shot you know and it, and you, you, ju you just have to somehow get their attention to let them know that this is, you know, hey, I'm here. You know, please, if you, if you, you don't, you don't want to have a confrontation in the woods. That's no. the last thing you want. No, is absolutely Any type not. of confrontation. Absolutely not, because it, this is supposed to be a respectful sport. But you want to make it so that, you know, please leave the area. I am here. Yep. And I know it's public hunting grounds, and they have the right to be there too, but... Which is why they don't have the right to encroach on your no. On which your is why hunting. you and I usually, when we started out, we have flashlights with us, so that way when we do see those hunters, we can pull that flashlight out and just give and, them a quick couple flashes and let them know you're there. Exactly, and hopefully that they're paying attention. And so far, I do believe in your 44 years and my 20 years that has worked almost every single time. Within, with the exception of maybe one or two moments where it did not work. Yeah, there's a couple times where I had. I had uh, I got up in my stand and I was up there at five o'clock in the morning. You know, just a nice peaceful, calm day, and you know, seven o'clock in the morning, a half hour after your light, and here comes some bozo walking through the woods and banging all kinds and making all kinds of noise and sets up 35, 40 yards in front of me, and it's like, you know, really, pal. Yeah, it it happens to the best of us. Now, as, as he as uh, my dad has said. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to public land and pub, uh, private land. Me, preferably, I prefer public land because, again, it is the purest form of hunting. When the Native Americans wildly roamed the plains, the savannas, uh, the deserts, the wooded areas from Maine to California, Oregon, all the way to Florida, when we had those Native Americans, uh, the Neanderthals, cavemen, there were no boundary lines, there were no property lines back then in those days. Even when the first settlers came to America, there were no property lines. These people had to go out and actually hunt. They had to take 
absolutely no knowledge that they had about the animals over here or animals that they do did know about and they had to somehow survive um when the first settlers came over they brought over firearms but the native americans were more efficient and more comparable and deadlier with the bow because they knew what they were doing yeah. so for me hunting on public land really brings you down to the roots of everybody's origin I don't care who you are or where you're from, to some degree, we all have that little bit of Indian in us. And if you don't know your ancestry, maybe um, maybe if you don't go by that, or you read the Bible, I do believe in Genesis, uh, chap Genesis chapter 3, 27 verse 3. Pardon my correction, I'm not biblically quoted at this point. Um, but it's, it's Abraham talking to, uh, and, and, and the verse goes something like this. Now, before I die, take thy bow and arrow out into the field, harvest that wild game, and bring it to me so that I can bless it before I die. So God's encouraging you, grab that bow, grab that arrow, go out and harvest that deer. Exactly. And I even on the King James Version Bible that I've downloaded at, um, that I downloaded to my phone, it even says the word venison in there. Now, I do believe that the word venison is actually used for the term of meat that it comes yeah. from the white tail. Sure. Awesome. So, whether you believe in the Bible, whether you believe that, you know, we've been on this planet since monkeys, whatever your belief is, hunting has been a part of this planet's life and lifestyle from the very get-go. That is, that is the honest to God's truth that hunting and archery itself has been around as long as mankind can was able to pick up a stick and arrow. Yeah. So we got one more interesting piece and I'd like to close with any more interesting uh, topics and thoughts from you. But we've got this thing right here behind us. I've got to point this out. We've got here a nice white-tailed deer hide that you had tamed yourself. Yep. It was my very first... Uh, Go at it, and you know it's nice and smooth, and conform, yeah. conforms to the, the contour of my couch, and very nice. No, and obviously for those that you can see, I, I am pulling on that with a decent amount enough to shake this badger. Now this is a Wisconsin badger, correct? Yes, it is. It's, it's one of two species. One this, of two species? Yeah. There's there's uh, seven species worldwide. There's two that are native to North America. This is the North American badger. Awesome. That is awesome. And the claws on on this is just... And if you want to take it up to the camera and give it a good look, it's, it's a two-year-old female. Um, I did manage to hit it with my vehicle. And when I realized what I had in my possession, I called the DNR and, you know, turned it over to them, had them take it down and do a necropsy on it so that they knew that this animal wasn't poisoned, it wasn't shot, it wasn't, you know, that it, it died the way I said it did. And and they gave and, and they gave me permission to have it mounted and, and keep it. Now, after I pass away, this animal will then go to the state of Wisconsin. It will be turned over to them. Do you believe that anybody that has possession of this should have permission from the state? Absolutely. Have, it's a state animal. You have to. If you don't have permission, if you don't have the possession tag, you're... And you do have the possession tag. I do have the possession tag. Okay. Now, going back to this deer hide, because I love this. I really do. Um, 44 years, and this is the first deer hide you've ever had. I can't believe that. My first go at it. That is awesome. And this is one of the things that um, Precision Archery Outpost, um, as you mentioned before that you are on the special council, that you have been helping me get this business up and running. Uh, this just goes to showcase that um, I've tanned hides before myself and you wanted to keep one deer hide of your own and I was able to help you do that. Um, I'm really glad that your work turned out. Um, obviously your work and teachings have worked out and paid off obviously through the generations, um, through me, through the years with all the hunting success that we've had. Obviously our friend uh, Deidre was able to secure her first year through your knowledge. Uh, Paul is actually working on that. We're hoping that this year turns out to be a good year for all of us, as always. Um, 
And yeah, I, I'm definitely looking forward to tanning some more for the whole hunting team. I really am. These turn out great with the traditional methods that we have developed and that we have that we are still working on and perfecting. Um, I would like to issue a challenge though. Um, now you've mentioned a few other names earlier before, uh, Bill Jordan, Jackie Bushman, um, obviously for some of you who haven't noticed, Michael Waddell's, uh, bone collector, I do believe that Michael Waddell actually hunted with Bill Jordan and Jackie Bushman way back in the early days. Yeah, they're, they're part of their pro staff team. Um, Ted Nugent, uh, how do you feel about Night and Hail? Uh, it's, you know, kind of a diamond piece, really. Yeah, it, it, it's it's all what you feel comfortable. Um, one one of my per personal favorites, like I said, he's no longer here, and that's Ben Lee. Um, ben Lee was a big man. He was close to three hundred sixty pounds. I mean, this guy. No, was, this this is B E N space L E E, not so that way somebody mistakes you for saying Ben Lee. No, it's Ben, capital B E N L E E, Ben Lee, and you can look him up. And this guy was just, you know. A, a pleasure to watch and, and, and listen to his teachings and stuff like that. He was one of the guys that I followed before uh, being introduced to Jackie Bushman and Bill Jordan, Ted Nugent, Fred Bear. Fred Bear. Um, I always followed Ben Lee and, and, and watched his videos that he was a part of and stuff like that. And he was just, you know, he, he was kind of comical being that he was a big guy. And, you know, but he, there was nobody that was more down to earth than Ben Lee. Awesome. So... Back to the challenge real quick, and hopefully we can get something for this. Uh, to those of the real tree, uh, Bill Jordan, Jackie Bushman, even Ted Nugent, if he wants to participate in this, um, even Michael Waddell, if he wants to. Now, I understand that these guys have their own tax permits and everything, but I'm looking to challenge myself to see if I can live up to their professional standards. Now, would you say this is professional grade based on... Based no, on the no, ones no, 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 no. This is, this is amateur, because this is the first one I've done. This is, it, would, it's by no means a professional hunt. Because, again, there's no professional. There's no expert. There's no perfected. Um, but it's mine. I'm proud of it. it. You know, it turned out great. Like I said, you know, you can yank on it like I'm doing right now, and the hide's not coming apart. The hairs aren't coming out of it. You know, it's, it's beautiful. It folds nicely over my couch and stuff like that, so... Yeah, I'm real proud of it, and, um, you know, I'd like to do more and, and try to... Do you think, um, ba based on my work that you've seen and the content that I have posted on my uh, pages over the months and since last year, um, do you think uh, they would be impressed with my work firsthand? I think so. All right. I think so. Well, Bill Jordan, Jackie Bushman, Ted Nugent, Michael Waddell... If you feel as though you want to give it a try, I am more than confident in my work. I'm sure my dad here is more than confident in my work. I am confident in your work, as you guys can see. Um, I'm more confident than to live up to the challenge. You guys want to bring me a deer hide? I'd be more than happy to work on it, and we'll see what comes about of it. What do you say? You think we could do it? Absolutely. Well, with that, guys, we're going to wrap this up. I appreciate you guys for tuning in and watching the very first episode of the Wisconsin Spirit of the Wild hunting team, Precision Archery Outpost, providing a touch of tradition to the modern-day bow hunter. And I can't wait for Precision to get up and running. I really can't. Um, it, it's going to be awesome. I honestly believe we're going to be the first of our kind with this business. Cool. Awesome. God bless every single one of you. Again, you guys, the, my followers, the supporters. Uh, your comments, likes, your questions are what drives this business. And after we're gone, there's no reason to moan. We're in the promised land where the whitetails roam. <laughs>